Hey, welcome to today's show. I uh, normally go back and edit out any profanity, but damn it, I couldn't do it this time. It was too many. So I want to warn you up front. There's a lot of profanity in this episode as I review this NPR interview with white supremacist uh, Jason Kessler. Um, sorry, couldn't be professional today, folks, uh, but I wanted to give you a warning if you have kids to um, cut down your volume, put your earbuds in. The Benjamin Dixon Show is only possible with listener support. Go to www.thebenjamindixonshow.com to register for our blog and join the Progressive Army. All week, we've been remembering the tragic events of Charlottesville's Unite the Right rally. It's been a year since... That's the voice of Noel King on NPR. And the best thing about this interview is the microphone quality. Like, good God, NPR has some amazing microphones. I should do a fundraiser for a Neumann um, U84. (laughs) That's what they use. But anyway, this episode, I'm going to show you... We're we're just going to... I'm going to play clips of this interview and show you why NPR is not qualified to do this type of thing. And... Therefore, it was utterly ridiculous for them to put Jason Kessler up on a platform, the organizer of the Unite the Right rally, uh, the same rally that killed Heather Heyer last year. Um, Why NPR was unqualified to put him up on a platform. Never mind the fact that they should not be amplifying the voices of white supremacists and white nationalists, even though he's going to say in this that he's not a white supremacist and not a white nationalist. He's clearly a white supremacist and a white nationalist. You should not be amplifying their voices just for clicks. But uh, here we are. Let's listen. In. March through the city chanting, Jews will not replace us. A white supremacist drove a car through a crowd of counter protesters, killing Heather Heyer. A police helicopter monitoring the rally crashed, killing two officers. Now, given all of that, it's hard to understand why organizer Jason Kessler would want to follow up. But he does. Um, first, it's not hard to understand why he wants a follow up. They have a mission And the death of Heather Heyer is merely a footnote in their mission, in their goal. Um, The the death of those police officers, merely a footnote that it means nothing to them. So the entire framing of like this, this is the I guess this is a justification for NPR giving a national platform to a white nationalist is to understand why he wants to organize this again when it went it went according to plan last time. You know, Heather Heyer was just a collateral damage to them. So the entire framing is ridiculous. But anyway, let's continue. We spoke with Kessler earlier this week and full disclosure, some of what you're about to hear is racist and offensive. I started by asking Kessler what he believes. I'm not a white supremacist. I'm not even a white nationalist. I consider myself a civil and human rights advocate focusing on the underrepresented Caucasian demographic. The underrepresented Caucasian demographic. In what ways are white people in America underrepresented? Well, because they're the only group that is not allowed to organize into political organizations and lobbies and talk explicitly about what interests uh, are important to them as a people. You have blacks who are able to organize with Black Lives Matter or uh, the NAACP. You have Jews who have the ADL. Muslims have CARE. You say that white people are not allowed to organize around issues that are important to them. I don't really understand what you mean. Are you saying the government blocks people, blocks white people from organizing into groups? Noel, no, that's the wrong question. That's the wrong follow up question. Here, he is making the argument that there is an equality in terms of problems faced by white people in America and marginalized communities in America. He will not, he will not, he will not confess that there is such thing as marginalized groups. Here, he is trying to draw an equivalence between the white experience in America historically and every other group historically. Black people, Muslims, and Jews, according to his list. That's the only framework under which you can act reasonably assert that white people in America need advocacy groups just like every other group. The reason we needed advocacy groups, groups to fight on behalf of our civil rights, is because our civil rights were historically withheld from us by white people. And she didn't even dig into what he was saying there, this idea of of white civil rights 
and the idea that there needs to be advocates for white civil rights. Let's, I mean, let's talk about it at face value, right? And this is what she should have done. Like she should have dug into this. Where is there a need for white civil rights in this timeline? Not, not an alternate universe where black people colonized America and enslaved white people, where, where Muslims are, are the predominant uh, religion in this country. No, we're living in a country where there is white male Christian supremacy. And underneath this, in this current timeline, black people, Muslims, and, and so many other marginalized communities have had to fight against that power structure just to be treated as equal. So in the, in the context of the timeline in which we live, where is there a need for white civil rights activism? Economically, they're the most powerful group. Politically, they're the most powerful group. In every way imaginable, every aspect of our society, white people are still the most powerful, most economically powerful and politically powerful groups on the face of the earth. And we're fighting for their civil rights. The fight for civil rights was against people trying to withhold it from us. Now, who's trying to withhold civil rights from white people? That's number one. Number two, underneath that, it is, a, it is an insidious attempt by white supremacists to paralyze any further progress for marginalized communities. That's what this entire white civil rights thing is all about. It is an attempt to use the language and the framework and the legal structure of civil rights activists and, and the civil rights movement to paralyze and to halt any further progress for non-white communities. The way they are attempting now to keep us from coming into parity with whiteness in this country is by declaring that any policy that is racially specific and designed to benefit black and brown people who have historically been marginalized in this country as a way of remedying the historical ills of this country, they declare that to be racist and discriminatory and, and then and subsequently get rid of that policy altogether. And the result is a complete paralyzation, a complete halting of progress for marginalized communities. See, this is how you exacerbate and continue racism by co-opting the language and the framework of civil rights. If we paint affirmative action, for example, as discriminatory against white people, then we can seize, we can halt progress for black people by getting rid of any policy that is built to remedy the ills of all of the hundreds of years of oppression that black and brown people have faced in this country. So the entire white civil rights movement is nothing more than a blatant attempt to prevent any progress for marginalized groups in this country. That, Noel, is the premise of his entire presentation of what he's fighting for, what he stands for, what he represents. And you didn't take 30 seconds to explore that. You didn't take a minute to explore that. In fact, you allowed his premise to go unchallenged altogether. And because you allowed his premise to go unchallenged altogether, he got to set the framing of the conversation, which is what he did here. It's not that there are laws specifically prohibiting white people from organizing as a lobby, but there is such a stigma around it where white people can do the exact same thing that a, another group of people do, and it's called supremacy. But if the other group does it, it's called civil rights. You are going to march on Washington this weekend legally with the permission of the National Park Service. What do you hope to accomplish? No, 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 no. You don't let what he just said stand. There's a fundamental difference. Oh, my. See, this is what happens when you allow people to do interviews who are not equipped to do the interviews. Sorry, Noel, you've done other amazing interviews, but this is you are not equipped for this. Because th what he just said is 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 seductive if go if, it, if it's left unchallenged. And this is why Nazis and white supremacists just want you to hear them, because what they're saying sounds pretty simple. It sounds pretty reasonable, you know, when, when we do it, it's considered it's taboo or it's 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 a uh, uh, it's a bad thing. It's supremacy. But when other groups do it, this is because he's taken completely out of context all of American history. When white people say white pride, it has been used as a tool of oppression without question. When they say white pride, it is a tool of preserving 
and halting any progress and preserving white culture and trying to keep America from becoming any browner or any blacker. That's what they mean when they say black, white pride. When black people, when, 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 when James Brown said, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. We had to say that from the perspective of always being told that we were, had nothing to be proud of. To being told that we're nothing more than slaves. When we say black is beautiful, we, we, we say that because through every image on television, historically and in and, and magazines and in, and just in writings back in the uh, during slavery, we were always depicted as ugly. We were always depicted as lesser. And so we as a collective people had to assert our beauty. We had to assert our pride because we were told we were everything else but beautiful and we had nothing to be proud of. And we were told that by the people who were saying white power and white pride. And if you can't understand why that is an important distinction, don't take the interview. What do you hope to accomplish? Well, my number one goal is to make sure that it's peaceful. Number two, I think that we have to stand up for the First Amendment because the First Amendment is, is under attack, you know, if not legally in practice. When Once people again, are Mr. Too Kessler, afraid you to... are about to march on Washington. How is the First Amendment under attack in your case? Well, I'm trying to explain it to you, but you're not listening. Okay, what please, the tell problem me, tell me, is, tell me. is that... W- Legally, I have the right. It's not that the police are trying to oppress me or that the government is trying to oppress me. Who is trying to oppress the the rights of white folks who are standing up for themselves are Antifa who come there uh, to use violence to shut down speech. And this has been documented. I mean, there are riots happening in Portland and Berkeley all over. Do you just think that there's one side to that? Oh, my God. The more I listen to this, the more ridiculous this is and and I, I'm trying to not necessarily comfort Noel King because, you know, um, we need people who are on that level to actually hear where they messed up and to do better going forward. Uh, so I'm trying to be uh, very measured in my uh, critique of her. <laughs> but holy hot damn, what the hell did you just let go unchallenged? Do you realize what you just let go unchallenged? It is this idea that they have the right to not be protested against. And honestly, I guess to her defense, this is the same type of shenanigans that uh, that go on on the left. Uh, the same type of arguments that go on on the left. I mean, shenanigans, right? I'm, I'm, this has got me so twisted. I'm, I'm using all kind of folk words. Uh, but, uh, but this is, this is re- a ridiculous argument. They, they believe that they have the right to organize without being counter protested. There's not a thing that would ever happen on the left. There's not a thing that would ever occur in marginalized communities where there won't be counter protesters from the right and from white supremacists. But yet they want the luxury to be able to organize without counter protesters counter organizing. That's what they want. And that's not how that works. And what they're seeking is governmental protections from our free speech. They want their free speech to be protected from our free speech. The only way they can organize without having counter protesters organize against them is if the government suppresses our first amendment rights to speech, to our speech and to our organizing. This is what they want. So so even on a very basic on a very basic government 101. OK, it's not government 101. I guess it would be government 401, of course. But in terms of competing free speech rights, Jason Kessler does not have the right to organize and not have counter protesters organize against him. That's never how this has worked in this country. The public square is about the comp- competition of competing First Amendment rights. See, the reason they need the government to protect them from our First Amendment rights, the reason they need the government to suppress our First Amendment rights to counter protest against them is because they their message has to go out unchallenged. Because if it goes out unchallenged, it is seductive enough to actually work. It it, it seems reasonable that if black people can say black pride, then they should be able to say white pride. But in context, if someone actually with some some. Some just a modicum of experience in these types of arguments actually has a chance to combat it on a national platform like, well, I don't know, NPR. Then that person can point out to them that there is a contextual difference. There is a qualitative difference between someone saying white power and black power. But if you get the government in the name of free speech to suppress counter protesters who would point that out, 
then they can spread their message unchallenged. Come on, Noel. NPR. <sighs> Mr. Kessler, one of the people you've invited to the rally this weekend has left messages on the answering machines of Jewish Americans saying that the Holocaust didn't happen. Um, you've also invited a former Grand Wizard of the KKK, David Duke. You've invited a public neo-Nazi supporter. Why are these people invited to your rally? I don't think you know anything about my rally. I haven't announced who the speakers are yet to anybody. You're going based on left-wing r- rumor mills. I'm citing the National Park Service, sir. Okay, and I have publicly stated numerous times that I do not want neo-Nazis at my rally, and they're not welcome. So you're telling NPR, you're telling NPR you don't want any neo-Nazis. We can broadcast that. Yes, absolutely. I've been putting that out on Twitter, and these people are attacking me. I'm getting attacked by the far left and the far right because I've believe that extremism is not where we need to go right now. But then After this rally rally? is over, I'm hoping that it will be peaceful and I can have a conversation or a debate with people from Black Lives Matter or Antifa because I think we've got to get back to dialogue. I, you know, just this is journalism one-on-one. This isn't even a philosophical thing. I mean, you you had the records from the Park Service. Uh, It's not only reported by NPR, but it's also reported by Fox News. You know, you let him wiggle his way out of that without being held accountable to who he has invited. You even allowed him to insist that he's not an extremist and that he wants all he wants is a dialogue. But he's fundamentally asking us to have a dialogue with people who don't agree that we're even human. That we're actually subhuman. And so you let that go unchallenged. He himself represents that. Like if nothing else, you could you could have pointed out that he himself represents something repugnant let alone the people he's invited, but you let him weasel his way out of admitting that he's invited David Duke and others who believe in the subhuman status of anyone who's not white. But here, let's go on. At this point in our conversation, I wanted to get a better sense of Kessler's beliefs about the differences in races. He references the work of political scientist Charles Murray, most famously known for the book The Bell Curve, which questioned the IQ and genetics of other races compared to whites. Murray's work has been debunked by scientists and sociologists and is deemed racist by many. You said you're not a white supremacist, but you do think there are differences between races. What, what are the differences? I'm not a human biologist. You can go and look into that. There's people like Charles Murray who studied that. There are differences in mental life just like there are in physical life. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous to say that, you know, there are no differences in height, let's say, between a pygmy and a Scandinavian. I have to pause for the irony of uh, Jason Kessler, who is uh, shorter than me, and I'm short. Um, making it seem as though he has the height of a Scandinavian. But let's listen to the rest of this drivel. So if we acknowledge that there are physical differences, obviously there are differences in behavior and levels of aggression in intelligence, in, uh, you know, bone density, et cetera, et cetera. But Do you think that white people are smarter than black people? There is enormous variation between individuals, but the IQ testing is pretty clear that it seems like uh, Ashkenazi Jews uh, rate the highest in intelligence than Asians, than white people, than uh, Hispanic people and black people. And that's there's enormous uh, variance. But just as a matter of science, that IQ testing is pretty clear. You don't you don't sound like someone who wants to unite people when you say something like that. You sound like somebody who <laughs> wants to tick people off. Well, it's a, you sound like somebody who doesn't respect science. If science doesn't comport to your oh, uh, social on. justice Charles religion, Murray, I would Charles challenge Murray, you really? bring up some scientific studies that conflict with what I'm saying. If you don't Basically have them, then we should just move on because not I'm not Charles Murray. I'm not telling you what I want to believe is true. If I was telling you what I want to believe is true and I'm a white supremacist, why don't I say uh, White people are smarter than everybody else, and we're better at everything. I do wonder, you talk about peace, you talk about telling your people to just... Okay, um, I had to let that play out <clears throat> so that you could see that she never answered and never really challenged him. That's not challenging someone. That is the type of response that you give when you haven't done your homework. Noel. And... I can't I can't play nice with you here. Why the hell? Why in the entire hell do you take did you take the interview if you did not want to do your homework? Because just five minutes, I swear to God, five, not even five minutes. 
It was literally 90 seconds of Googling gives you an answer to the question that you know is going to come up. If you, because you asked the question, if you ask the question about what he believes in terms of the intelligence of black people compared to white people, you know, it's going to go to the bell curve. You know, it's going to go to Charles Murray. 90 seconds of Googling gives you a list of scientific critiques of Charles Murray's work. Now, me as a black person, I don't intend on spending my afternoon proving my equality to some um, white supremacist. I just rather punch the motherfucker in the throat. But as a journalist who doesn't have the burden of the rage of what white supremacy is and has done, you have the you have the luxury of discussing this from an academic perspective and could have just completely eviscerated him. See, it takes a lot for me to not just, you know. Punch a bitch. Because I don't have to prove my humanity to these little fuckers. But you as a journalist, if you had done your homework, just 30 seconds, maybe 90 seconds of research. You even have research assistants, but I digress. Just a little bit of homework. You could have come up with a list, an entire list of academic critiques of this and not just say that they exist, but actually quote some like Harvard professor who's now passed away. But he, he wrote the book Mismeasure by Any Measure, Stephen Jay Gould. And this is what he had to say about the work. He said, quote, disturbing as I find the anachronism of the bell curve, I am even more distressed by its pervasive disingenuousness. The authors omit facts, misuse statistical methods and seem unwilling to admit the consequences of their own words. That's just one quote on a page that took me literally 30 seconds to find. You could have you could have offered uh, an appeal to authority in this case, which is not a fallacy in this case because of the nature of academic critiques. You could have given them very specific quotes instead of some vague reference to to their existence. And then you allowed him to insist because you could not give him anything in response because you didn't do your homework. You allowed him to assist that you didn't respect science. And you came with this, you, you came with this tepid, ridiculously inept argument. Oh, you don't sound like you want to unite people with this kind of language. Oh my God. And then you give him the opportunity to grandstand as though he, oh, I'm merely standing on the science, ma'am. Oh my God. Don't do these interviews if you're not equipped for them. But more importantly than just uh, quotes, you know, because maybe maybe NPR can't afford uh, research assistants, you know, and God forbid a journalist actually does footwork themselves. Um, it's a little sim- simple thing called correlation does not imply causation. Because the ultimately what Charles Murray does in his book is that he says, if we look at this data on IQ, it appears as though black people or no, not appears. They insist that black people have um, lower IQs than white people. And then they go one step further and make a causal relationship between it to say that because they are black, this is what white supremacists do. This is what, this is what Sam Harris did not challenge when he had Charles Murray on his show. And I didn't expect him to because at his core, Sam Harris is a racist white supremacist, but this is how they use it. They're implying that because you are black, your IQ is lower. And this is where I, I do. I I mean, something in me comes up that makes me just want to punch a bitch. But if you don't have the burden of the anger of what white supremacy has done and it continues to do in this country, then you can very flat footedly say, ask them question. Charles Murray, Jason Kessler, do you believe that the reason black people's IQs are lower according to the bell curve do you believe it's because they are black or do you believe that there's other institutional that that there are other factors at play here and that's where you expose them as either racist or disingenuous the only two outcomes from that because either they're going to say yes i believe that black people's iqs are lower because they are black exposing their racism or 
They're going to say, no, I don't, you know, I don't think that there's, 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 there's probably other things at play. And then you explore all the other things that are at play, all the institutional, all the historical factors that are at play, which are the reason, Jason Kessler, that there are organizations like the NAACP because they are there to help us overcome all of the years of oppression that lend us to not performing on these cultural IQ tests because at the core of them, they're more about your environment. They're more about where you grew up, how you grew up, what you were exposed to. And that's the reason we have these organizations. Subsequently, I mean, obviously the outflow of that argument is this is why white people don't need civil rights organizations. God damn it, NPR. You just all you did was give this guy a platform and let him spout it. You didn't do any work here. Stay on their side of the fence. Given what happened last year, is a rally really the right way to go about having this dialogue that you want so badly? People don't want to have a conversation right now. You, you have do, to though. force the Come conversation. On, you do. You've said you do. You're the leader of the group. I do. You I do want to have this. a conversation. So, so do it on a couch. Don't do it in the street. <laughs> <laughs> that little laugh Jason Kessler gave at the end, um, that was the most accurate answer he gave in the whole um, interview, because that's the natural response to that ridiculous. Go do it on the couch. Go do it. Don't do it in the streets. That's uh, what's the, what's that got to do? And then, and then the snark that you have, what you do, you want to have the inner conversation. So have a conversation now. No, 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 no. You can't snark your way out of this. And uh, you know, you have the responsibility as a journalist to expose the truth, not just explore people's ideas. And the truth requires doing some homework. Or just don't get up there at all. If if it seems to you that I'm being harsher on Noel than I am on Jason Kessler. It's because Jason Kessler was given the platform by Noel King. And he was given a platform without being challenged. In not in from a journalistic perspective. Not from a philosophical perspective. Not from a historical perspective. I mean, there was no challenge whatsoever. Let's see. Let's see if there's anything in this last few seconds of this. I think the the public square is the last place that we have a right to. People say, uh, well, it's okay to censor Jason Kessler or Alex Jones or whoever from YouTube and Facebook because those are private companies. Yet when I'm trying to go into a public park and exercise my rights, then you say I shouldn't do that either. Why not go back to YouTube? So there's really no place that it's okay for me to speak. Ding, 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 motherfucker. There is no place that you have the right to speak unchallenged. There is no place where you can go and spout this hate filled, racist, uh, pseudoscience bigotry that you're trying to spread a historical bigotry that you're trying to spread in order to maintain the white supremacist power structure in this country. You have no right to spout that without being challenged, except for on NPR, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> hey man this thing will wear you out and wear you thin so i'm done for today I, i've got nothing else to give on this topic um npr should be ashamed of themselves noel king i don't do this again don't do this again if you're not going to do your homework if you're not going to do your homework then yield to people who are prepared to do this at the drop of a dime i don't want to do this like i've said many times in this podcast i would re- i would rather just punch the motherfucker in the throat because i have no responsibility to prove to a racist scumbag, my right to exist in equality, in equality with them. That's what I would rather do. But if you're going to give them a national platform, an international platform, you sure as hell better be just as prepared as any one of us who are prepared to do this at at, at the drop of a dime. Or just don't take the interview at all. Don't, don't. NPR doesn't need any more of your money. Go to my Patreon and give it to me. Because I did more homework in 30 minutes than they did leading up to this interview, this national interview. I'm done. Have a good weekend. I'm going fishing. Do something to enjoy yourself. Despite white supremacy being amplified by the national public radio. 
The Benjamin Dixon Show is only possible with listener support. Go to www.thebenjamindixonshow.com to register for our blog and join the Progressive Army. Thank you.